review uh, the control of Yoni's disease um, and doing so, uh, I'm going to try and obviously in 20 minutes is a slight task, but I want to look quickly at the prevalence of the disease, some cost aspects of the disease, uh, how it spreads in the herd, and most importantly, um, in terms of this evening, how we identify its presence and how much or how its prevalence in the herd, how much disease we have in the herd, and uh, particularly important, once we have identified yonis in the herd, what are our options in terms of control? So first of all, in terms of uh, prevalence, how common is yonis disease within the UK? Um, well, as you can see from the slide here, um, surveys in 2006 um, looked at around two thirds of uh, the farms having identified as uh, yonis positive. Um, about a third of those already knew that was to be the case, so that showed that at least two thirds were unaware of the presence of the disease, um, which is, is not that uncommon. Farmers frequently are unaware that the yoni is actually in the herd, and we'll come on to the reasons for that very shortly. Um, further work again by uh, NML in an internal analysis of their 30 cow screens came up with a very sim similar figure of around uh, two, just over two thirds again of, of herds showing evidence of positivity to the disease. What is very clear is that um, Yoni's disease it does seem to be very much on the increase. Previous uh, studies on, on prevalence of Yoni's uh, back in the early 2000s and prior uh, were coming back at lower lower levels, and the reasons for that uh, and the, the reason for the rise of Yoni's within the UK uh, are. Um, not fully understood, but increase in herd size, increase in intensity, uh, in, um, possibly the pooling of uh, colostrum, milk, etc., management practices, etc., may have uh, contributed to the rise of yonis within the UK. But uh, we say we are, they, these are our theories as to what, what has happened. No one can be absolutely sure as to why um, we have more yonis disease around. So the first question is, you know, why why are we worried? And and, and I think, you know, hopefully by the end we should, you know, I shall fairly clearly demonstrate that something we we definitely need to be uh, taking control of. Um, we, you know, with a lot of farms we're struggling with mastitis. If you look at the national instance of mastitis, it's running around 65 cases per hundred cows per year. We've got a significant lameness uh, disease issue within the UK. We're obviously battling with fertility, uh, cow, cow, losing cows for. All sorts of reasons, you know. In essence, for many farms, are thinking I've got enough problems to deal with. Why should I be worried about yonis? Now, that that particularly sort of stems from the point I was making about farms often being unaware of of um, the problem in the first place. I'm sure you're all very aware of the classic clinical uh, syndrome for yonis, which is the cow that gradually uh, starts to lose condition, uh, it develops a scar. We can and then sort of gradually deteriorate some waste away and eventually has to be cold or will be died uh, will die not the case however that's that really is only the uh, the iceberg of the story in these clinical cases and for many farms they never actually see the clinical cases because these cows are being cold prior to these these more obvious clinical symptoms uh, being seen and the reason they're getting cold is that obviously yonis is a disease that is uh, eating away at the cow and it's going to result in, in all sorts of uh, problems in terms of both production loss of these cows are, are poor yielders which is the reason obviously why they may be sort of proactively cold but they're also going to increase susceptibility to other problems uh, such as uh, mastitis, uh, lameness uh, and infertility so the, the 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 greater problem, in essence, for many many farms is is the is the uh, predisposition to uh, increase culling and, and reduction in yield of of the yonis cases, rather than the, the direct losses of the losing the cows themselves. But that's that's not to say that obviously losing individual cows itself cannot be a significant problem for farms, when particularly when you get very high levels of prevalence of the disease. So looking at the uh, the work done on what sort of effects of milk yield do we get, then we're looking. Obviously, it depends on the severity of the disease that you know at the time the uh, the cows looked at. So uh, obviously, the the cows that are in early stage of uh, Yonis disease uh, will have less effects on yield than the ones that are obviously severely uh, full clinical mode. Um, but we're looking at a sort of uh, subclinical and subclinically affected cows are not avert, not avert the scouring or losing condition, a 10% reduction in milk yield, and uh, a 11% increase in the probability of involuntary culling, which is obviously very significant indeed. 
So it's one thing to say that uh, you know, there is a, a cost of this disease, and that, you know, uh, but there's another to say is, is there is a cost benefit in terms of control. Uh, and certainly, when we come on to look at the measures for control, it's very obvious that control is uh, is uh, fairly resource intensive, uh, and as such, you know, does have costs attached. However, the, the basic message I'd want to get across uh, in terms of, of that is that, uh, as you again see from this this graph here, looking at uh, uh, we have a percentage of infected cows in here and potentially a gradual increase in the prevalence of the disease in the herd and that's going to be, if you look to the right hand side, associated with a significant increase in cost or in this case a reduction in, in profit. Um, however, farms that adopt control measures uh, are obviously achieving the opposite. We're reducing the disease and then so improving the profitability of the herd. So the basic action is, well, uh, you know, action does cost money. Inaction will cost you far more money in the long term. I, it is always, always worthwhile adopting uh, control measures for Yonis once you've identified it in the herd. So how does it get there? Um, well, almost invariably, uh, Yoni's infection is felt to enter the herd through the purchase of inadvertent purchase of infected animals. And again, please bear in mind that frequently uh, animals that are shedding Yoni's may look perfectly normal. They're not, well, you know, it's not a question of buying uh, a skeleton that's uh, pouring out loose feces. Frequently, these animals will look perfectly normal. But, uh, you know, at the time of purchase, particularly if they're coming in as heifers, where the disease is very unlikely to be showing any sign of uh, rearing its head at that point. The problem with the, you know, once these animals are entering the herd, uh, they will start to shed the bacteria into the environment. The Yonis bacteria is a very uh, resistant, durable bacteria. It can last for a very long time in the environment, and uh, you know, if it finds its way then into the young stock cows, and particularly in the young, where the young calves are kept, and we'll come on to the fact that the calves are the, the, by far the most susceptible animals in the in the herd to new infection. So. You know, the, the right from birth, the, in probably the, in the first 24 hours, probably being the time of increased most susceptibility, but certainly up to um, sort of three months, a high level of susceptibility to contracting Yonis. Um, then uh, we, then that's how you know, having got the uh, Yonis bacteria on the farm, we start the cycle of developing a further infection. So as I've just said, um, the predominant uh, uh, infection, the pathway of infection, is calves ingesting um, con feces containing Yoni's bacteria, and the, and the dose, the, the sort of dose required, is, is very small indeed. We're not talking about large lumps of manure contaminating to cause infection. Minute, very small numbers of bacteria are all that are required to infect an animal. Uh, and that infection can come from contaminated bedding, from cow, calves sucking on a contaminated teat, um, or contamination of uh, buckets with um, colostrum or milk. Um, the yonis can also be excreted in, 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 in particularly in clinical animals, but also in subclinical animals to some extent, uh, directly uh, in the milk itself. So about 35% of clinically ill cows will shed the bacteria in the milk, and about 3 to 19% of subclinical cows will do that. In colostrum, those levels are higher. Yonis can also be spread uh, transplacentally, so there is a potential um, for calves to be infected <coughs> excuse me, in utero. But really, for all intents and purposes, the thing that we are forever concentrating on Yoni's control is trying to break that cycle of, of uh, fecally uh, infected material uh, getting into calves from the adult environment. As I say, 80% of Yoni's infections, uh, it's very much a question of very early life of the calf, and then we would talk about 80% of infections occurring in the first month of life. It is also important to point out that um, while 80% of infections will occur in the first month of life, um, you know, resistance will gradually to infection will increase, but there is um, recognition now that while certainly about a year of life, resistance is generally as, as much as it will ever be, it is not impossible for an adult animal uh, to become infected in, in the face of very high levels of contamination. So, um, and potentially also the animal is immunosuppressed for any reason. But as I say, in terms of the overall uh, control, one way we're concerned about it is the calf and the control measures around the calf and the, you know, with the, that we will be concentrating on. What we need to understand, and this comes again back to the fact that for many farmers that don't even see the disease, is this, this principle of um, the iceberg concept, concept that 
for every animal that you see a clinical sign, there will be seven to ten animals uh, shedding the infectious agent eye. There will be a heap of um, subclinical animals which are carrying the infection that are inapparent to the naked eye, but these animals will also be contributing to the shed of infectious agent into the environment. Um, and there are both further animals still that have yet to actually start shedding what will be in the, what we might call the silent incubation period of the infection where they're brewing yonis but have yet to start shedding or, or, or become subclinical for want of a better description. So in, in heavily infected herds, um, we would expect about 25% of animals to be fecal culture positive, i.e. they are actually contributing to the shed infection of the bacteria into the environment. And obviously that's a, a huge challenge to overcome because once you've got that level of environmental contamination, ensuring that that doesn't end up in, in calves' mouths is a, a very difficult challenge indeed. Germane to this point about um, uh, the level of subclinical infection in the parents is that we, we go and uh, test uh, a herd for, for yonis. Um, because of the, uh, diff uh, the nature of how the test, uh, looking for antibody, how the test works, and the fact that animals uh, in, the, in the incubation period may well not be, uh, will probably be unlikely to have actually started shedding antibody or, or producing antibody to yonis. We are not going to detect all the infected animals in, in a herd, uh, uh, particularly on, on one-off tests, which means that if we are relying on a, a, a single uh, annual test, for instance, there is a severe risk that we will not pick up all the potential animals that are contributing to our problem of environmental contamination. So this, this graph sort of neatly illustrates this point. So if we think about a Yoni's infected herd, we have this hopefully this high proportion of non-infected animals that are not a problem for us. Um, we have these animals that have become infected, as probably as, as I say, in calves in the first month of light, and these are our potential future problems. We have uh, then some normal shedders where they are generally really intermittently or, or or some level continuously emitting small levels of yonis uh, through the feces and possibly a little bit of uh, milk. Um, we need to identify these to avoid transmission, but they're unlikely to be the major problem to us. The, the significant problem in terms of the proportion of bacteria being shed in the environment are the animals that are entering the, the more later stages where we're starting to see, first of all, some production loss, and then um, obviously the ones that are, are then starting to show clinical signs. At the point they're starting to do this, they are shedding huge numbers, billions of uh, Yonis bacteria into the environment. Um, and uh, obviously that's going to be uh, a significant risk for um, the ability to control the disease and further spread of the disease. How are we going to set about um, controlling well, we're, you know, what we're going to do with Yoni's disease? Well, we need to set a strategy uh, for the farm and obviously that uh, strategy is something that uh, uh, needs to be developed between the farmer and the veterinary surgeon. Um, and it will take into a variety, uh, uh, particularly, particularly, first of all, assessing the prevalence of yonis on the farm. Is it there? And if it's so, if so, to what extent it is? Uh, the biosecurity, sorry, the biosecurity risk associated with the farm. You know, uh, e.g., what's the risk of purchase of this disease onto the farm? And maybe we are yonis free, but are we? Have we got policies to prevent that? Remain, you know, to make sure that remains the same, uh, or vice versa. We already have some level of yonis, but we are at risk of further uh, increasing that by what we're doing. The potential for buying containment risk uh, on the farm, so the sort of purchase onto the farm, and then the risk of spread within the farm. Um, you know, such as the fact that the, uh, the young calves are kept in the same environments as the adult cows, um, pooled milk feeding, pooled colostral feeding, etc. So we need to understand the, the, the risks of spread if the is in the farm. We also need to understand the, the resources, both in terms of capital and time, and so in, in human, you know, just, you know, we have to be realistic about what control measures we can bring. There's no point talking about snatch carving every single cow, whether there is no way that that is going to be ever practically achievable. And also in, in aspiration, do we, are we looking to eliminate yonis from the herd or simply contain the disease at, at levels that we are, are hopefully, presumably at relatively very low levels that uh, we are, we are, you know, it is not causing a significant problem. Um, it's also important in terms of aspiration to be realistic. Um, if we, our aspiration is to, to try and remove the Yoni's disease from the herd. We have to be realistic about how 
long that is going to take. There's no point talking about eradicating gonies in five years. If it's a very high level of prevalence disease, a significant biosecurity risk and a significant biocontainment risk. Uh, there is some um, very useful tools for assessing these risks uh, and why healthy herd uh, that can help you sort of quantify the, the, the risks that we've been talked about there in terms of biosecurity and high containment and prevalence, et cetera, that if you wish to, to look at that. So we um, look now um, at how we're going to establish uh, an understanding of where we are. Do we have yonis or not and to what extent? Um, we're going to look at how we're going to um, uh, sorry, I was, we're going to have to look at what sampling we're going to, to do to achieve that. Um, and the, the basics um, our message here is the, 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 the greater the uh, numbers tested and the more frequently they're tested uh, for the reasons of the, of the fact that uh, essentially the test is not perfect, that we are going to always, just by the nature of the test and the nature of the disease and the pathology of the disease always miss potential um, animals, um, positive animals. Uh, the more we do and the more frequent we do it, the more reliable our results are going to be. So we start at the bottom there, the, the use of the idea that we can use a bolt milk uh, ELISA to accurately determine uh, herd status to Yoni's disease, I'm afraid, is just really not, not feasible. Um, it's just what we call poor, too poorly sensitive. It's a high risk that uh, a negative result may not indeed be a true negative eye that will end up a false sense of security. Uh, it is, isn't enough, a good enough test to determine herd status. Uh, our next option is to do a targeted cow screen, and the classic being the uh, the sort of 30 cow, the 30 cow screens. These can be, uh, they use, you know, the, the statistics on these are that they're relatively reliable, but they're, they're certainly not perfect. And one of the problems is it's very difficult to predict exactly where positive animals may exist in the herd. And uh, as such, and while there are tools that aim to reduce that risk, uh, it's still not by any means the, the perfect uh, measure. The, um, the next level up and the one I would always advocate when investigating uh, for Yonis is whole herd individual samples. Um, this basically, uh, obviously, in the days now that we can do this via a milk recording, massively reduces the complexity and, 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 and ease and practicality of doing this. The advantage or always is going to be that you're going to go away with a much better understanding of the, of the true prevalence. And you're never really going to get a wrong answer by doing all herd individual screen. Uh, if there is no yonis, you can be you know coming through on that. That's obviously a great news, but uh, you can be a lot a bit more confident that is the case. If you've got a very low prevalence, then you you know you know this is going to help you direct. And we'll come on to this, but the, the most appropriate control measure. If you have a lot of yonis, you're very glad you knew about it. So there isn't you know there's you know there is isn't going to be a reason why that, that result is not going to be of strong value to you. Um, obviously, the, the, the better still is having gone to a whole herd individual screen is to repeat it because, as I say, the more times we repeat it, the more confident we can get, both in terms of the fact that the yonis does exist, but also um, the prevalence that it's um, going to be at. So that moves us, assuming therefore that we, we do, unfortunately, when we go to screen, um, find that uh, we do have yonis, uh, we're going to have to then think about how we control it. And um, I'll just take you back to the slide just to, just to say the key point of this is in terms of breaking, what we need to do is break this cycle of infective material emanating from the adults and, and entering the calves. So we're going to have to really think about um, how we you know, how we manage both cows and calves and, and feeding, et cetera, and the environment such that we can achieve this. And this comes into the, the Action Yonis and the National Yonis Plan, uh, and really we can condense the potential strategies into six options in terms of how we could go about Yonis disease, con disease control, and I'm just going to quickly walk through the potential options for doing that. However, just before I do that, uh, I, I do think it's important just to talk about some of the practicalities of, of Yoni's control. Uh, to my mind, it is vital that all parties, obviously the, the vet and the, and the farmer, need to be uh, fully conversant of what the plan is and how it's going to be put into place. But anybody who is going to be responsible for putting those actions into place also need to be thoroughly aware and understand how those controls are going to be operated and the requirements for them to achieve this. You know, the point being that there's somebody out there who isn't in the loop, that the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. 
Uh, and as again I said before, the program and the targets are realistic in terms of the farmer circumstances. You know, it, it, in one level, a simple disease. You know, once you understand the, the, the you know, the, the, you know, the, the reasons why the disease occurs, in essence, in some ways, the control measures are, are, are relatively straightforward in terms of understanding them. But to actually deliver them is is intensive uh, and difficult, and uh, such expectations need to be there. And certainly, educating staff on what's going on, I think, is very, very germane and helpful in making sure that we get compliance to what we're trying to do. I'd also, you know, from the point of view of um, anybody managing, whether you know, either with a vet overseeing or, or the farm manager or farmer, uh, revisit protocols. Don't assume that um, everything has been done just because it was set up that direction. Frequently, things have a habit of breaking down, and it's always worth going back and checking that the protocols we put in place are are actually still being adhered to. So we go on to the six options. Uh, the first option uh, is. Uh, that we can reclassify as sort of virus security protect and monitor. So these are uh, herds that have gone through the screening process, um, presumably through, well, well, certainly I would suggest it has to be through the whole herd individual test and, and, and more than certainly more than one occasion too. And we've come to the conclusion that, um, that there's no evidence of the existence of the disease. Um, at that point, uh, really what we need to do is, is put the drawbridge up and set up some very robust plans to protect the herd from disease entry. Um, and, and obviously that's going to address you know, acquisition of stock and, and, and there could be a big question about whether even that's ever going to be a, a sensible option at all. I that really we should be aiming to stay or remain closed. Um, we're going to have to think about slurry management and you know where cattle might be grazing, etc. And we're still going to have to think that um, even with, with uh, hopefully what is a very robust and strong biosecurity um, system, uh, we're still going to have to consider some level of appropriate screening tests because uh, nothing in life is ever perfect. It could, you know, it, as simple as a, a lorry coming onto the farm with the only material on the tyres could be enough to start a problem off. So we do need to be aware that even when we, it, you know, that there's nothing infallible in life and the one thing we don't want to do is assume we're okay and then discover 10 years down the line that we're far from it. So still some level of screening uh, going through is, is going to be very important. Um, just one point about purchase of stock, obviously back to the difficulties of um, testing, particularly in younger animals, and we really not like to see antibodies developed in animals less than two years of age at the very earliest, and therefore the assumption that the stock are clear of your nutrients just because they've been tested and are free and appear to be negative is not a reliable uh, system for purchase of stock. The second option we have is to, is, can be classified as improved farm management. And this is uh, this is relying on assuming, in essence, that everything has yonis, uh, and therefore that we're going to manage every every cow and, and calf um, in the same way as if we were going to, you know, if, if assuming that animal is infected. So obviously that's going to concentrate on the extremely uh, hygienic calving environment, management of um, individual colostrum, individual animals, uh, use of you know, milk replacer, etc. Um, so it is, in a sense, all the things that factors that we would need to put in place uh, to make, you know, across the farm individual buckets, making sure there's no way of tramping uh, contaminated feces and on woolly boots between cows and calves, etc. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's everything that is required on the farm um, to reduce the risk of, of fecal contamination of, of um, uh, calf feed or you know, the calf ingesting uh, yogis contaminated material. What we're suggesting in this one, though, is there is no individual cow testing is undertaken. So it's not a question of we're not uh, with every we say back to this point, every cow is assumed to be positive and managed as such. Um, again, as in the previous option, uh, we're still going to require a level of herd surveillance, uh, at least to establish um, a starting point and also to assess how well we're doing. It, you know, is this system of um, uh, working uh, and are we actually reducing the prevalence? Obviously, when we're doing this, it's going to require an immense amount of dedication and labour. It tends to be more favourable to, to farms where there is uh, a low level of, you know, obviously, it's, it's really not going to be suited to farms where there's a high prevalence of disease, so it's better suited. This is a system that we're going to consider utilising on herds of relatively low prevalence of yonis and tends to be the smaller farms, but again, uh, large farms that can, that can put the systems and protocols in place. It doesn't say it has to be all small farms. 
Okay, so I've, I've already yatted on about this, but obviously just to reiterate, you know, improved mind management is focusing on say prevention of ingestion of uh, these contaminated uh, feces, uh, particularly obviously the younger animals. Um, so we I say we're going to have to look at how we uh, manage colostrum and how we're going to you know manage milk. Certainly, pooling of any of those two is is going to be a complete no no. We might want to consider pasteurisation. We're certainly going to want to consider use of milk replacer potentially. We're going to have to consider the hygiene, how cows are managed, how hygienic, where they're managed, where they're housed, etc., to make sure they're again that they're well away from any risk of uh, faecal contamination and and cleaning and disinfection uh, of, of the uh, the calving areas and the young stock needs to be taken into account too. Um, the third option, then, uh, having gone from there, is is best described as um, improve farm management, in, but introducing uh, a level of uh, risk assessment and uh, via strategic testing um, of of the herd of the herd. So what we're doing here is saying, look, we're not going to try and manage every single animal uh, as a suspect. We're going to only manage the animals that we consider to have um, evidence of Yonis disease, and we're going to do that by um, some form of process of systematic sampling of the cows, and I'll come on to the three sort of basic options we have on that. The advantage of this process is obviously reduces the workload because then and the, the difficulties in the management because we are only concentrating on the cows we feel we really need to and we can carry on uh, managing the rest of the cows as we had planned to do so before. Where we can uh, go with that are we can either do um, regular whole herd uh, testing and probably in the end particularly sort of the use of quarterly testing and obviously that's going to be particularly suitable for herds to moderate to high prevalence where we need to be constantly on top of uh, which cows have the disease um, and and again this is particularly valuable in, and also in year-round calving herds where we you know we need to be uh, always aware of, uh, of the cows entering the dry period as are, are likely to be the ones that we're going to have to manage um, uh, separately, so one of the key areas in, in terms of strategic testing is that we're going to make sure that the only positive cows, the ones that we are at risk, are clearly identified and will be carved away from the, the, the normal area of calving cows and that certainly no uh, colostrum or milk is, is taken from those cows and, and fed to uh, ideally the, the calf itself but also to any other calves. So uh, that, that's the first option is quarterly testing, the second one is um, a single test of a pre, just a pre dry off and this is really going to be um, this is obviously far less rigorous it's really going to be a, a system that you may want to consider um, for for um, block calving cows uh, block sorry block calving herds um, uh, on the basis that obviously the, the one time we really need to understand whether an animal is only is to say before she enters the dry period and calves down obviously by using a single test we are significantly reducing the cost of uh, of testing but we do uh, by the same note can reduce the, the the level of sensitivity we are going to miss potentially positive cows by doing this uh, and we're also going to end up with a, a, a being less clear on the status of other cows. Um, one option we can use, therefore, in, in terms of this, is is use a single uh, one-off uh, test and then uh, move to the uh, a double test system where we um, either try and test twice before drying off via a milk recording, or we test once via milk recording, and then you just go to the cows that identified as positive on that, and then repeat with a further milk or, or potentially a blood sample to to help us ascertain the true status of the calf. Obviously, the advantages of going back to the risk-based control, regular testing, um, we, you know, it's set up, this hassle-free testing. Uh, we know it's going, to, it's going to allow regular monitoring, and we know it's going to happen. Um, and by being thoroughly aware of which cows are uh, uh, highly positive or moderate or whatever, we can ensure that we actually uh, cull these cows before they become these, these super shedders and the severe problems in the herd. Uh, it reduces the and its ability to basically also, as I say, manage the majority of the herd. Normally, we're not putting uh, our labour and res time resources into every single cow, but just dedicated to the cows that we do need to. Fourth option uh, is is to go one up from uh, strategic management and is is again to use the improve our management. But where we test positive cows, uh, we look to immediately cull them uh, rather than take any risk of retaining the herd uh, and managing them within the herd. 
Now, um, obviously, this is a, a zero risk um, policy in terms of, of, of the owner's control. There's never a risk that you're ever going to, um, you know, uh, let that animal further contribute to spread by removing urban culina. Um, but obviously, it also comes with a significant additional cost. And, and most analysis would say that, uh, you know, frequently this is not going to be cost beneficial. Uh, policy, unless we are in a, a very low prevalent situation to stop with, to start with. Sorry, um, so uh, it's a, it is a it is a definite an option. It depends on attitude to risk, uh, and also potentially the attitude to adopting um, proof of management control policies. But it, it definitely, uh, you know, the thing that probably most important to say is that. Um, you do still need the idea that you can control your owners just purely by uh, testing and culling and not adopting uh, improved farm management policies and by containment and biosecurity policies. It's been rather proved, uh, very much proved dead in the water. Any studies that have looked at that have all said that cull, culling alone is not sufficient, that we, we, we're going to do this. It still has to come with the, the correct improved farm management policies. The fifth option is. Uh, in essence, move to a flying herd, breeds to a terminal size, so everything uh, in a sense we, we give up trying to breed replacements. Obviously, um, now, obviously, that's a fairly dramatic decision to take, and it's generally going to be um, taken in herds where there is a very high prevalence of yonis, such that the ability to, uh, and or where the risks of uh, biocontainment, etc., are so difficult that uh, it's felt that the, the ability to replace and improve farm management into the system is unlikely to be successful. Um, so it's obviously I say, a fairly dramatic decision to take. Um, but the, obvious, the reason for its ability to work is obviously that it would be if we're breaking the cycle because we don't actually um, uh, rear replacements that are going to become, that have been affected by yonis, then as eventually as the stock that we've bred on the farm is gradually culled out and replaced with bought in stock. Hopefully, particularly, we've managed to buy bought in stock from, um, but, you know, you know so herds of known status and therefore all yonis free themselves when they come in, we should gradually reduce the risk of, of, of yoni disease um, being present in the herd and, and, and obviously over time reduce the overall levels of environmental contamination. Um, it is important to say that um, uh, any calf produced out of the system, because it's going to be produced on the farm where there's a lot of, uh, initially a lot of environmental contamination, whoops, sorry, I beg your pardon, I thought there's something before, um, must, um, you know, make sure that any animals, you know, beef animals produced through the system must be slaughtered for beef and not enter the stuck to the herd as breeding animals, because obviously all you're doing is transferring your problem to somebody else. The final option we have, and again, is, is to adopt to consider a vaccination protocol. Um, this is, uh, again, uh, a very um, uh, sort of uh, last option, last scale option. Uh, it is definitely only one that you'd want to introduce for high risk or high prevalences to buy some time. Uh, it's important to understand that vaccination uh, does not prevent animals becoming infected, it just delays the onset of clinical signs and that already reduces the, some of the costs that I've talked about at the start in terms of loss of production, increased culling, etc. Uh, the problem is that any vaccine animal always test positive, so uh, interpretation of any tests becomes almost impossible and extremely difficult. The other problem we have is that uh, vaccination will interfere with the tuberculin test and that increases the possibility of false positives and to some level false negatives also within uh, tuberculin, uh, the tuberculin test, which obviously has uh, obvious ramifications for the herd. Um, so as I say, if we, if we move to this, what it will do is also by moving to vaccination, reduce the level of shedding from, from animals and hopefully again over time that will reduce the level of environmental contamination. Um, but uh, as I say, vaccinated stock should not be viewed as uh, 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 free, they should be viewed as effective, and that falls there to problem as to how do I come off a vaccination protocol if I go down that route. So just finally in summary, key messages to control the illness disease. First of all, understand your status, um, eliminate the sources of infection. Next uh, is break the link, prevent new calf infections, uh, and obviously within all this degree of a herd specific risk management strategy between the farmer and the vet that we say can come from one of the six sort of pillars that I've just outlined. Uh, further information uh, can be found on the Action Yonis UK uh, website or by contacting the Yonis delivery team. Um, 
that uh, for action yoni. So thank you very much, and uh, that's the end of the, the presentation.